this morning we are going to discuss and see that we do in fact serve a God who gives us a fresh start. This wasn't something that was just applicable to Jonah. This is something that is very much available for us today. And not only that, we're going to see through this sermon that Jonah is going to give, that a singular message can create a chain reaction that has eternal value in ways that we could never imagine, which is why I decided to call this morning's message a fresh start. And you want to know why Satan hates the concept that God gives us a fresh start. He hates it because he knows that we can become an unstoppable force the moment we trust God and believe that his word is in fact truth and something that we can place in our life daily. The enemy knows that when an unbeliever has a radical encounter with Jesus, that the result is beautiful. That they turn from their sin and they turn to Christ. The enemy knows that one person giving their life to Jesus, given a fresh start, can create a chain reaction in expanding the kingdom in ways we never imagined. And here in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah is no longer running away from God. He's finally actually running towards God. He finally has tapped out and said, all right, I'll do everything you told us. Which is why in the third chapter of Jonah, we're going to discover three points. First point, that God does give second chances to the undeserving. The second point is that we are to be sent out like Jesus. And third and final point, we're going to see that God's word is like a fire that can spread quickly. But in my experience, as most of you know, fires don't spread unless one person lights the match first. And that is where we begin, ladies and gentlemen. So let's start in verses 1 through 2 of Jonah chapter 3. Let's read it again. It says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Now, the word of the Lord has already come to Jonah. He came to Jonah in the very first chapter. And now we're entering the third chapter, and we know this story. We know Jonah hears, he disobeys, he runs, he cries, and then he smells like fish vomit as he is on dry land heading to Nineveh. The word of the Lord coming to him a second time was an indication, and I hope you noticed it, that we serve a God that gives us second chances. More specifically, a fresh start. Something that a lot of us feel like we've disqualified ourselves from. And I want to point out before we go on to remember two verses in your mind. It's not going to be on the screen, but the first one is found in Romans. Paul poses a question. He says, should we sin so that grace can abound? Are you familiar with that verse? Hey, should we sin because we know grace is always available? And Paul says, no, certainly not. He gives this idea that if we've died to sin, if Christ died on the cross, then we should no longer be a slave to the very concept that I can go back to my sin because I know grace is always available. God wants to give us a fresh start for the sake of being used for his glory. And maybe for some of you, a fresh start is, sounds so amazing because like me, maybe some of you had a smelly, nasty past. And you need to hear this, okay? You need to hear what I'm about to say. God still wants to use you right now. He wants to use you. This idea that he who begun that good work in you, is he's going to continue it. Pastor Adam taught about this last week in Philippians. Philippians 1, 6, and he who begun a good work in you will continue, will complete it in you until the day of Jesus Christ. God never gave up on Jonah, thank God, because the word of the Lord came to him a second time. So yes, we serve a God who gives us a second chance, a third chance, a fourth, so many chances. In fact, listen to this, Isaiah 38, 17. I love this verse. You have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption for you have cast all my sins behind your back i love that for a couple of reasons he didn't just deliver us from the pit of corruption he lovingly delivered us because it's his loving kindness that leads us to repentance and i hear that verse and that sounds really familiar 
You want to know why it sounds familiar? Because it sounds like what Jonah prayed in the second chapter while in the belly of the great fish. Jonah 2, 6. Jonah said, the earth with its bars closed up behind me forever, yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. That's where Jonah, he's confessing. He's tapping out. He's recognizing that you have, in the same way, you've, you've lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. And his pit of corruption, painful disobedience. Guys, the beauty of confessing our sins to the Lord is that he keeps no record of wrong against you when you do it. And that's a hard thing to like wrap our mind around. That he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. Check this verse out. Hebrews 10, 17. The Lord declares, I will never again remember the sins, their sins, and lawless deeds. The biblical meaning of forget literally can be translated or mean to not hold against the person and let it affect your relationship with them. And for a lot of people in here, forgetting seems easy, but we quite remind ourselves and others around us, hey, remember that one time when you messed up so badly, but I forgave you anyways for it, but I'm going to bring it up right now, 10 years later? With the Lord, that's what makes him forgiving us so beautiful. And I, guys, I really want you, I want you to understand this concept. Follow me for a second. If God is in fact omniscient, Meaning if God, in his nature, his very character is incapable of forgetting anything because he is all-knowing, nothing is beyond his understanding. Yes, God can't forget anything because, again, it literally goes against his nature. But listen, but he chooses to not hold our sins against ourselves if we've confessed it to him. Warren Wiersbe had the brilliant way of putting it. It won't be on the screen, but you know what, Warren Wiersbe, I, I love this saying. Warren Wiersbe put it this way concerning God. He remembers to forget. He chooses to forget your sins if you've confessed it. And then, then that to me just blows my mind that Jesus, who is all-knowing, who created all of existence, who has the authority, the only one who has authority to give us eternal life, the very one that is described as the spotless lamb, chooses to forget your sin if you confess it to him. That is why you will hear me constantly say in this place that your past doesn't define who you are in Christ today. Praise the Lord that we serve a God of second and third and fourth chances. Because the reality is, and I think most of you can agree with me, we don't deserve it. And yet God in his grace still chooses to show us. With that said, because again, we've, we've established we don't sin so that grace can abound. With that said, we have to remember that there are consequences for our sin. And we briefly talked about this a couple weeks ago when I told you, I need you to differentiate the, the two. There's a difference between going through a trial and there's affliction and bad things happening to you that were not self-done. They just are happening to you. And there's a difference between that and going through something because of the result of your sin. I just finished watching a documentary by Lonnie Frisbee. Do you guys remember who Lonnie Frisbee was? He was known as the hippie preacher in the early 1960s. He was monumental when it came to the Jesus movement. Now, separate from some of his doctrinal views, I need to preface this. God used him powerfully. God used him powerfully to see a generation of youth in the 60s give their life to Jesus. He was a part of the Calvary movement at the beginning. He eventually had a fallout. But the, toward the end of his life, he revealed a tragic thing. He revealed that he was in a secret relationship while he was married with his wife, with another man, that he had a life of homosexuality before he gave his life to Jesus. And he was in this relationship with this other man for six months. And to make a long story short, he contracted HIV. He lost his marriage. He damaged his ministry. He completely destroyed his, his credibility. And in the end, he actually died from AIDS. But in the documentary, and I thought this was so no noteworthy, he was, it was told that he pleaded with the Lord to forgive him. And this is something that's not often talked about in church, but I'm going to say it from the pulpit. I believe God forgave him. 
And I believe not only did God forgive him, it reminds me that there's nothing that you have done that is beyond God's forgiveness. That we do serve a God that gives us a fresh start and second chances. I know for me personally, when I hear stuff like this, I know for me, it's like I want to learn from my experiences and my mistakes so that I don't hurt those around me and those that God has entrusted me to love and defend. Every single person that comes to my office and shares some personal stuff, I don't look at them and go, (laughs) I would never do that, weirdos. I look at them and think, I'm just as susceptible to be in the hot seat like them. And these are the reasons why. Because I'm human. But these are the reasons why I want to sow to the truth of God's word. I want to reap up everlasting and righteousness because God's word is going to guide me through this process. In Lonnie Frisbee's case, his sins were forgotten, but they had consequences. Some of you are wondering, what does this have to do with the story of Jonah? Jonah, ladies and gentlemen, understood that he was undeserving of any second chance or a fresh start. And yet God wanted to use him. God wanted to use Jonah. And that's why he's instructed in verse 2, Arise, Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach the message that I am going to give you. And that is a sobering verse because it reminds me of the importance of, A, God's word has eternal value, not John's word. Anyone that you hear from this pulpit that tries to give this clever saying, which, by the way, God gives us gifts. And and I recognize my gift right now is to teach God's word. I recognize that. But I also recognize it's God's word that has eternal value. Anything that I say has nothing in comparison to the word of God. That's why we do expositional teaching. That's why we teach through the Bible here at the church, because it's alive. Hebrews 4.12 puts it this way. If you don't believe me, the word of God, it's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word and God's word alone is going to do that. And that's why I love that God has to preface to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, and share, preach the message that I give you. Have you ever heard a pastor pray before he teaches? Lord, let it be your words and not my words. Like, that's not some metaphorical thing. That's a truth. That if we're led by the Spirit, we want to be able to convey certain things that hit home for you. Because a lot of you will often come up to me and be like, how did you know about the, my life, the, the thing, and the stuff? I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, you know. Did my wife tell you to tell to my husband? I'm like, no, this is God's word. This, and this is the beauty of it, is that like, it, it's timely, it's perfect. Because in season, out of season, God's word is going to bring truth. And some of you who are all too familiar with this story, my prayer is that God's word penetrates your hearts, not John's word. And for Jonah, he's given a second chance to give this this message, even though he's undeserving, which leads to our second point. If we are given a second chance, then we should be sent out to have a heart like Jesus. Read verse 3 with me back in Jonah 3. So Jonah, he arose, he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Now, Jonah, Jonah's learned the lesson the hard way. He learned the lesson the hard way. If, you know, if God told him, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, cry out against it. Their sins come up before me. You better believe now by the third chapter, he's going to do exactly that. Arise and go to Nineveh. He knew, okay, I did that the first time. Yeah, I even tried to end my own life and God still got a hold of me. But notice, I want you to see Nineveh again. It's described for the second time as an exceedingly great city But notice the next part that we didn't know about till now. It's a three-day journey in extent. And the idea behind that statement is probably to indicate if you were to look at the circumference of the city and you were to walk around the entire city, that it'd probably take a good three-day journey to see the metropolitan circumference of the city as a whole. Which, by the way, according to some historians was about 60 miles in circumference. That's a lot of walking. 
Speaking of a lot of walking, I just went to Disneyland this last week with my children. We were there from Monday through Friday. And yes, we, chose, we told the kids, it's like, it's either college or this. What do you choose? So um, anyways, I calculated on my steps app how many steps we took between Monday and Friday of last week. You want to know how many it, were, it was? 95,235 steps. Guess what that is equivalent in miles? 33 and a half miles I subjected my children to walking. And you know what? This means my family and I, we could have walked half the circumference of Nineveh with minimal complaining. <laughs> Let's be honest, there would be so much complaining. You know what I learned about the happiest place on earth, Disneyland? Kids still complain there at Disneyland. I like how all the parents are like, you should have known, you could have asked me, I would have told you that. <laughs> Jonah, who is finally obeying the Lord, he's able to see the extent of this exceedingly great city called Nineveh. And I want you to notice this great city. We're described, or it's described by historians, like I told you, it's about 60 miles in circumference, 19 miles in diameter. They had walls around the city that were about 150 feet tall, and it was said that the walls were wide enough to race three horse chariots on top. It was an impressive city. It had 1,500 guard towers. Defensively, architecturally, it was exceedingly impressive, a huge city. And on this three-day journey around the city, we're told exactly what Jonah was saying. Read verse four with me. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out. He's giving God's message, not Jonah's message. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I want you to now put on your imaginary hats with me, okay? He's going around the city for three days sharing this. But remember what he looks like right now. No, seriously, like, I was thinking about it. Like, he probably looks like Jeff Goldblum from the movie The Fly after he's all, like, deformed and stuff. Don't Google that. Anyways, um, and here he is. He's pale, reeks of vomit. He's probably missing hair, and he's walking around the city. He's like, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And some of the Ninevites were like, is that a ghost? What was that that walked by? Like, I think there was a legitimate concern for this man, this Hebrew man walking around the city. But I think, I really think God used even the visibility of how he looked to get their attention. Because it wasn't the way he looked that got a hold of their hearts. It was the message. And for Jonah, as I'm imagining that he's going around the city, he's sharing this. And we're going to learn this when we get to the fourth chapter. Yes, he is obeying God, but he's doing it reluctantly. He's doing this, but he's doing it because he knows that if he doesn't, he can, he'll deal with the consequences. And I think, in my opinion, we can fall short and be guilty of this same thing where our attitude, we know we need to love people. We know, John. But we struggle with it. It's hard to love people, especially who are not loving to us. It's hard because in our mind, it's like, well, I'm going to be loving to them if they're, if they're loving to me. And more often than not, for a lot of us, because we've trained ourselves this way, when we see a group of hurting people, we're annoyed. I don't want to deal with them because we feel like they're obnoxious. We wish they would go somewhere else. But Jesus had the opposite attitude. In fact, in Matthew chapter 9, as this herd of people are making their way to see Jesus, he sees them. And I want you to listen to what Jesus, how he reacted internally when he saw them. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. I, I love that. I mean, I do. He sees this group mobilizing, and he wasn't annoyed. He wasn't irritated. He's seeing them as a group. That's the group I'm supposed to minister to. He's moved with compassion. His heartache was a result because the text just told us they were like weary. They were weary and scattered. They were like sheep with no shepherd. 
They were aimlessly walking. Like, what? I mean, you're, you're looking at the picture and you're seeing like much of our culture today. This, this mind-numbingly walking around, what's the point of life? And we see them and a lot of us were just annoyed by that. We were especially annoyed by it. And I know because I'm guilty of this. We were especially annoyed by it during the campaign of who our next president was going to be. And we're watching the news. We're just annoyed by people. And then the Lord just, man. And the Lord has a way when I'm so annoyed that he shows me like, you know what? You were annoying once, but I loved you still. You annoyed people and you still annoy them today. And then it made me, honestly, guys, it made me think. I don't have a burden for the loss the way God has called me to have a burden for the loss. And then it made me think of the, the worship song that some of you know. I'll, I'll read the lyrics to you. Show me how to love like you've loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am, it's for your kingdom's cause. Maybe you've sang that song and you've always wanted, it's basically sharing that the heart of God is for us to have a, a burden for the lost. Not just any ordinary burden, because this is the cool thing. Because according to Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus sees the multitude coming towards them, and he was moved with compassion because he looked at them like they were weary and scattered, having, like, they were like sheep having no shepherd. I want you to note what he says to his disciples as soon as this happened. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, Jesus says in response to be moved with compassion, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know what that tells me? It tells me that we are called to have a heart like Jesus when we're ministering to the lost. Because he sees this group of people and it breaks his heart. He doesn't see them coming and he's like, oh, the freeloaders are back, Peter. Tell them I'm in my office in a meeting and I can't come right now. No, he looks at the, the disciples and he's like, guys, the group of people that's coming toward us right now, I know you're looking to me to fix all this, but guess what? The harvest is plentiful. There they are. They're ripe, man. They're ready. But the laborers, that's you guys are few. And so now we need to come up with an idea that, that, that we pray that the Lord of the harvest send laborers into the harvest. You know what that means? You guys are the ones to do it. And that's honestly my heart, too, that you guys come to church. You're excited about the word, man. And invite people to church. Like, come and hear the pastor that, that's up there every week, and he's crazy. And like, but you know what? Great. Bring people to church. But you know what's more exciting? When you become the preacher, and you hide God's word in your heart, and you become the light to them. A lot of you guys don't realize you have more of an effective ministry oftentimes than I do. Yes, I have the mic and you guys are listening to my voice right now and you guys are going to leave this place and have lunch with your families. But you're the ones that are going to have time with your coworkers and time with your families for hours and hours. And God, God has a ministry in plan for you right now that go, extends beyond Sunday mornings. The disciples had nothing but the message that God gave them. And I need to just warn us, guys, we may have the message in front of us right now on your phones and on, on your actual physical Bibles. You may have the message, but if you don't have the burden, you are not going to be as effective. Or you'll be effective like Jonah, but you're going to be bitter. Man, I would rather be effective and joyful than effective and bitter at everyone around me still. Like I said, we have too many bitter Christians. And if we think like the disciples of Jonah, we're just going to get annoyed when we see the lost. And I don't want to be annoyed anymore, guys. I want to I be moved with compassion like them. Because the reality is, if they're coming to us for answers and we're not giving it to them, they're going to go somewhere else. J.C. Ryle, an English professor from the 19th century, once said, the highest form of selfishness is a man content to go to heaven alone. That's why it's not a shocker to me that we're so consumed with ourselves that we will only minister on the basis of how we feel. And I'm here to tell you that is not what true biblical Christianity is. You don't minister on the basis of how you feel. You minister to on the basis that you're forgiven 
in Ephesians 4, 32, and be tenderhearted, loving, kind, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. We minister to people and forgive people who have wronged us because we were first forgiven. And for Jonah, yes, he's obeying God finally, and he's delivering the eight-word message, which was, by the way, it's only five words in the original Hebrew. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. By the way, that word, that number 40, is seen throughout Scripture. It's a number to indicate judgment and or trial. Think about it. The, the people of Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness. It rained uh, for no, on Noah's ark for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was tested in the wilderness for 40 days. And now here in Jonah chapter 3, he's delivering a message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so as Jonah, he's walking around spending three days throughout the, the extent of the city. He's delivering this message. And this brings up our third and final point. God's word, because we know it's living and active, here's the third point. God's word is going to spread like fire. But like I said, in my experience, fires don't spread unless one person lights the match first. So let's look at verses 5 through 6 now. So the people of Nineveh, they believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from greatest to least of them. (laughs) They believed. To Jonah's shock and surprise, they didn't laugh at his sermon. They didn't threaten to lay their hands on him and attack him. They responded, the entire city, and they put their faith in God. In fact, that word repent in the Hebrew occurs four times just in verses 8 through 10, which is a, I mean, should give you an indication of what the central theme is for this passage, that all the expectations of this violent city, they, they believe, they respond, they put on sackcloth. It's funny to me how shocked we are sometimes when we hear about certain people and giving their life to Jesus, <laughs> right? Sometimes we hear certain things and we're like, they gave their life to Jesus? John Geraci gave his life to Jesus? I thought hell would freeze over before that day would happen. <laughs> You know, I, I've, said, it's, I've shared this before, but I'm reminded of the story of, when, you know, when God got a hold of my life and I gave my life to Jesus, and then God called me to the ministry and pastor, pastoring, I was in Charleston and I was visiting here to teach for my dad. And this lady came up to me, and I, to this day, I can't, I, I want to I meet her again, but she came up and she's like, praise God, he's using you. And I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. I, yeah, I love that the Lord is using me too. She's like, no, no, no. Praise God he's using you because you were a terrible kid. <laughs> oh, I mean, yes, that is true. She's like, no, I mean, you were awful. And I was like, yeah. I'm going to talk to someone else now. And she's like, hang on. You were so awful that your mom would come to women's Bible studies crying because how terrible you were. Like just digging the knife deeper and deeper in. And I'm like, and then she said, but praise God, because we prayed for your salvation every single week. There's power in prayer, guys. And there's even more power When people understand the gospel, when they finally understand God's grace in a way that helps you see the bigger picture. Because for Nineveh, they believed in God. They responded in faith to the warning that Jonah was giving. Again, it reminds me of a quote. If you've never read the book Radical, it's by David Platt. Highly recommend it. This quote reminded me of what we're talking about right now. David Platt says in his book, Radical, when you and I realize that we are morally evil, dead in sin and deserving of God's wrath with no way out on our own, when you begin to understand that, he says, we begin to discover our desperate need for Christ. And I think that the people of Nineveh recognized their lack of good works wasn't going to save them. (laughs) I think they recognized We're heading toward a a, a destruction 
that we cannot escape. And the only thing that we can do is turn to the true living God that this pale man walking around the city is reminding us of. And they place their faith in it. Ten people heard, then 300, then 1,000, then 15,000, and then over a, quarter, over a half a million people are responding because of this singular message. Revival in ways we never thought was possible. And that's quick. That's insane is what that is. Because again, we've recognized that God's word is living and active. It's alive. The very message that God gave Jonah is penetrating the hearts of the people. Paul the Apostle understood this. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2 says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then. You still stand firm in it. Listen to this. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message that I told you. Paul was the messenger, and the gospel was the message that was able to save them. So that's why when I say things like, God's word has eternal value. My word doesn't have an eternal value unless the words that I'm saying pertains to the word of God. So God's message begins spreading like wildfire. And now we read how the message spread all of its way to the king of Nineveh. Read verse six with me. The word came to the king of Nineveh. He rose from his throne. He laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes, which seems like a weird response. It's like some, some of you are like, I've never done that when I repented. Um, why is he doing that? Before we talk about why he's doing that, I want you to see what he, the decree he put upon everyone, not just people, but everyone. Verse 7 through 9, he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man or beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth, cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? The act of putting on sackcloth in the ancient world most of you probably figured this out, but I'll share it anyways, was a response and a sign to mourning. The sack, it was kind of like a, it's like wearing a burlap sack. That's kind of what the equivalence of what it was like. And it was this incredibly silly looking and uncomfortable thing. But yes, even the Ninevite king is willing to humble himself and wear it. He takes off his royal robes, his armbands, his jewelry, his bling bling, And he shows a sign of repentance that I'm wanting to not just with my words show that I'm repented. Repented. I want to show in my actions. He takes the spotlight off of himself, demonstrating I need forgiveness, man. No one ever comes to the cross. I've told you guys this before, but no one ever comes to the cross proud. You come humble, realizing I'm not even deserving of this, but God, if you find it in your heart, would you forgive me of my sins? This king had nothing to offer except his humility through repentance. And any hint of pride, he wanted to be completely eliminated. So he put on sackcloth. By the way, if you guys are struggling in worship in general, Some of us think that worship is just the 15 minutes before the Bible study and the 20 minutes afterwards. We kind of have the same thing. We have this attitude towards worship sometimes. I don't like that song. It's too loud. There's not enough hymns. There's too many hymns. You know what I really, again, the moment you think worship has to do with you is the moment you miss the point of worship. Worship has everything to do with adoring and adhering to the King of Kings the one who is deserving of our praise. If you have a hard time with worship here, with anything, guys, you're going to have a hard time with worship in heaven. (laughs) When we're singing with the king of kings and with the angels and with the choruses of voices, he's worthy of our praise. And with worship, it has nothing to do with us. And for the king, he wanted nothing to do with him. He wanted to give all attention to God. And the crazy thing is, did you see? Let every man and beast be covered in sackcloth. How did they do that? But then it made me think of all the people obsessed with dogs. And some of you know who you are. You have those little outfits for dogs. Can I just point out, that's weird. 
Second of all, if people can figure out how to put little outfits on your animals today, the king probably figured out a way to put sackcloth on every single animal there. So they repent. Will God relent from his ways? Read the last verse with me, verse 10. Then God saw their works, and he burned them anyways. No, it doesn't say that. And you want to know why I said that? Because Jonah is assuming that's going to happen. And we're going to see it in the fourth chapter. But guess what happens in chapter 3, verse 10? God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, a lot of us might read this verse and ask the question, okay, so then does this confirm that Jonah is a false prophet when he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and it doesn't happen? No. And for two reasons. Number one, God acted in total consistency with his character and word. And let me tell you why. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8. I hope this verse is sobering because a lot of people ask this question. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it. Listen to this next part, guys. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon them. This is not new news. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the idea is, until you've given your life to Jesus, you do have condemnation to look forward to. And we know that the Bible says that God desires that none should perish, that all come to repentance. We recognize that because it says it in the word. That's not my word. That's God's word. And until we recognize the truth that Jesus is the only one that can save us, we do have condemnation to look forward to. But the moment you give your life to Jesus... There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That anyone who is in Christ, man, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new now. And this is exactly what is happening in response to the people of Nineveh. Second thing to know, even though they responded right now here in Jonah chapter 3, guess what? The warning was presented, but God actually does eventually judge Nineveh. Some of you are like, really? Really? It's actually recorded in the book of Nahum. The Ninevites, their repentance here was delayed 150 years. And then it kind of made me think about the condition of our nation right now. And it made me think, like most of you are probably thinking, why is God showing mercy to us as a nation around the world when we have people who are deliberately not just disobeying God, but adhering to evil practices. And then the Lord reminded me, we think that we have the answer to delay God's judgment on us as a nation. And I'm here to tell you that nothing has changed in terms of the message still being powerful. You may think our nation is hopeless, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say this to hopefully clear the air. My trust in the nation is not on the basis of my political orientation. My trust in the nation is on the basis of God's word being powerful and active and the very thing that's able to save our nation. I believe in a God who just as I responded to the gospel, we as a nation can trust in God again and encourage to trust in God again. Man, God, he gives us second chances. He sends us out to have a heart like him, and we, and, we, and we can be that singular fire that spreads. I'm going to end with a story before I invite the worship team up. I shared this story on the men's camping trip, so if you've heard it, you're going to hear it again. Have you guys heard of the name Edward Kimball? He may not ring a bell with a lot of you, but in 1856, Edward Kimball was a Sunday school t uh, teacher. And in that year, Edward Kimball was outside of a shoe store, and he just felt by, like led by the Holy Spirit that he needed to go inside and share the gospel with someone there. And to his surprise, he was thinking, like, this is weird. You go into a shoe store to buy shoes, not to preach the gospel. Well, he does it anyways. He starts sharing the gospel with the shoe salesman. And that shoe salesman that day was named D.L. Moody. 
And D.L. Moody hears the gospel, gives his life to Jesus, then he begins a preaching ministry. That, and again, if you're not familiar with this guy, I mean, God used him powerfully. Well, a guy by the name of F.B. Meyer was stirred by D.L. Moody's teachings and messages that he started proclaiming or preaching a ministry very similar to D.L. Moody's. Years later, F.B. Meyer was preaching at a college and a student by the name of Wilbur Chapman gave his life to Jesus after hearing F.B. Meyer teach. And Chapman, he worked for the YMCA. He decided to hire a former baseball player. Some of you might know who this is, Billy Sunday, to become an evangelist for the YMCA. I have a point to all this, I promise, I promise. <laughs> Billy Sunday came to Charlotte, North Carolina, and he began preaching. And all these businessmen are hearing him, and they're excited, and they're like, this is amazing, we need to put on a, a, a gospel revival meeting. So they put on a crusade, and they hired a guy by the name of Mordecai Ham. And the very first night that Mordecai Ham was preaching, a man came forward and gave his life to Jesus. And do you know who that person was? is Billy Graham. And if you don't know who Billy Graham is, Billy Graham has preached the gospel to more people around the world than any human in history. The person you give, God lays on your heart to minister to could be the next Wilbur Chapman, the next Billy Sunday, the next Billy Graham. I mean, that's what happened with me. I, I am a result of all this, and I'll explain to you why. My dad in the early 70s, was invited to Costa Mesa by a surfer dude to hear the gospel. And guess who was teaching that night? It was Tom Stipe. And Tom Stipe led my dad to Jesus that night in the early 70s. And then my dad was trying to convince his best friend, Skip Heitzig, to give his life to Jesus. And Skip got mad at my dad and said, you're not even a good Catholic. Why are you telling me about Jesus? And then Skip Heitzig heard the gospel from Billy Graham preaching on the television. And then Skip gave his life to Jesus, and he's pastoring a church in Albuquerque, and my dad was invited by Skip to go to Albuquerque to teach before we came here. And, and the whole point, the whole point of why I'm sharing all of those things with you is because we think that God only uses the preacher at the pulpit. I, and I'm here to tell you that your singular zeal in your heart to tell someone about Jesus could create a chain reaction that you are completely unaware of. Edward Kimball, the surfer dude that invited my dad to church, they all have this in common, that they were faithful to bring one person to Jesus. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do right now. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I'm going to give you this final thought. God gives us a fresh start and second chances for the purpose that he shows his consistency, that he desires that none should perish and that all come to repentance. God wants you to have a heart like his to share with the, lost, the, the gospel to the lost. And you may dismiss it and you may think, like, God's not going to use me, but I'm here to tell you that your singular passion led by the Spirit telling one person about Jesus could create something far greater than you could ever imagine. For Jonah, he delivered the message, but he's going to the nearest hill in the fourth chapter, and he's waiting for the fireworks show, but he's going to find out that God did not do as he said because he saw a group of people re repent. I'm particularly excited for the very last chapter, and I hope you guys will be here next week. But man, praise the Lord, we serve a God of second chances. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, God. We pray.